Marcel Proust, dead at 51, the eyes that had looked so penetratingly at life were closed forever. Only hours before, fighting off pain, iron-willed, he had been correcting those manuscripts which Cocteau had predicted would live on after him like a ticking watch on the wrist of a dead soldier. They were the concluding sections of his seven-volume novel, Remembrance of Things Past, whose influence on world literature would be incalculable. Marcel Proust was born in Paris on July 10, 1871, the year the disastrous Franco-Prussian War ended. His mother was Jewish, a woman devoted to the arts. His father, a Catholic, was a man of science, a distinguished professor of medicine and epidemiology. His was an old family dating back to the 15th century, to the town of Illiers, which Proust, in his novel, was to call Combray. There, as a child, he would return every year to spend his Easter vacations with his grandparents. His maternal grandparents lived in another town, and he was as deeply attached to them. Combray was, in fact, a composite. How could any of them have guessed that their dreaming little grandson would immortalize them all by translating his childhood memories into fiction? For all memory, Proust believed, however deeply buried in the subconscious, was subject to involuntary recall by some random sensory perception. A dramatic example is this celebrated passage from his novel. When I returned home one winter's day, my mother, seeing that I was cold, offered me a cup of tea, something I don't ordinarily drink. She'd sent out for some of those plump little cakes called madeleine, which are molded in the shape of scallop shells. At first, I declined. And then, for no reason at all, changed my mind. And when, mechanically, weary after a dull day with the prospect of a depressing tomorrow, I brought to my lips a spoonful of tea in which I'd soaked a morsel of that cake and the mixture of warm liquid and crumbs reached my palate, a shudder ran through my whole body. I was aware that an extraordinary change had taken place within me. An exquisite pleasure had overpowered my senses the origin of which was a mystery to me, and I ceased to feel mediocre, irrelevant, mortal. From whence could have come to me this overpowering joy? I knew it was somehow related to the taste of the tea and cake, but also that it infinitely transcended taste. It was of a different nature altogether. And suddenly, the memory came back to me of the madeleine soaked in lime blossom tea, which my Aunt Leonie used to give me when I went upstairs to see her on Sunday mornings in Combray. Just as the Japanese amuse themselves by filling a porcelain bowl with water, steep in it little bits of paper which at first are without character or form, and observe how the moment they become wet, they stretch and bend, take on color and distinctive shapes, become flowers, houses, or people. So in that moment, all the flowers in our garden and in Monsieur Swan's park, the water lilies on the Vivan, the good folk of the village and their little dwellings, the parish church and the whole of Combray and its surroundings sprang into being, towns and gardens alike, from my cup of tea. The age of 11, Proust was enrolled in the Lycée Condorcet, an elite literary secondary school. He was even then dreaming of becoming a great writer. Though suffering from asthma, he joined the army at the age of 18. Then, after briefly studying law, he obtained a degree in literature. 
During the Dreyfus affair, Proust, as a half-Jew and liberal, passionately supported the condemned officer. Social success came to him early in life. He became acquainted with Anatole France and with the beautiful Countess Greffel, a collateral model for his Princess de Guermant, with the poet Esthete Count Montesquieu, a partial model for his memorable Baron de Charlus, and with Reynaldo Hahn, a minor composer who was to remain his friend for life. Despite his father's wish that he pursue a solid profession, his mother supported him in his ambition to become a writer. And on the completion of his formal education, he toured Normandy and Brittany, also Bruges and Venice. He had fallen under the spell of medieval architecture and under the influence of John Ruskin, the English art critic, several of whose works he translated. Summers he would spend in fashionable summer resorts, Baalbek being the name he gave them in his novel, and he would tour the surrounding countryside by the newly invented automobile. Cruz shared with his impressionist and symbolist contemporaries an original way of looking at the world. A world, he said, which at first sight might not be pleasing. But when the artist says, look and look hard, lo and behold, we see a world different from the old one we knew before, yet one which is perfectly clear. A world which was not created once and for all, but which is created as often as an original artist turns up. Such is the new and perishable universe which has just been created. It will last till the next geological catastrophe is precipitated by a new painter or a writer of original talent. Memory and time were obsessive themes, relating him to his great contemporaries Einstein, Bergson, Freud, Kafka, and Joyce. But perhaps the most apt analogy to his work, with its flashes back and forward in time, is to a theme and variations in music. Almost certainly, this is the voice of Proust himself we hear, speaking through one of his characters. As before a rising mist, I perceived a phrase from a sonata, so distant, I barely recognized it. Hesitantly it approached, then disappeared, as if frightened away. Then it returned, enveloped, draped in silver, brimming over with brilliant sonorities. Yet his characters, Proust maintained, were not based on real people, though there might be as many as eight or ten of them in one character alone. One of these is the composer Vintel, whose haunting little phrase appears again and again throughout his novel like a light motif. My memories of the sonata, he wrote, are of a musical phrase I heard one evening, certain charming though mediocre measures from a sonata by Saint-Saëns. And when the piano and violin crooned like two birds in conversation, I thought of the sonata by Franck. When I created the character of Gilbert on the Champs-Élysées, it was of Mademoiselle Bernadette I was thinking, she who had been the great love of my life without her ever knowing it. In fact, it was his mother who was at the center of his life, a woman of beauty, intellect, and sensitivity, whom he worshipped in a state of utter dependence. Most certainly it was of her and his own childhood that he was thinking when he wrote, My one consolation when I went upstairs for the night was that Mama would come up to kiss me after I went to bed. But this good night was so hurried and she left so quickly that the moment I heard her redescending the stairs, and heard the rustling of a blue muslin frock along the corridor, I felt pangs of the deepest sorrow. 
It told me that she had left me for the night. So much did I long for that goodnight kiss that I hoped it would come as late as possible so as to prolong the joy of anticipation. Proust's whole life, in a sense, was a prolonged childhood reflecting the need to be loved, praised and desired. And he was one of the first to write openly of homosexuals being one himself. From his student days and even before, he had been afflicted with asthma and rheumatism, which contributed to making him more an observer of life than a participant. It prevented him from running and jumping and giving vent to his free impulses like other boys. Yet, he had never given way to bitterness or envy. The child he might have been, but could never be, was to find himself through introspection and literature. And to literature, he brought the ability to retrieve from his prodigious memory a fictional quasi-autobiographical world of which he said, I invented and recorded nothing, only discovered and translated. Though when young, he played the dandy and ardently courted the aristocracy, in the end, it was its sterility he exposed with a mixture of comedy, irony and pathos of which he was so subtle a master. Here is his description of how the Princess de Guermont achieved her reputation for intellectual superiority. After dinner, the chairs were arranged in such a way as to form little groups in which people had to turn their backs to one another. The Princess displayed her social sense by sitting down with one group and then, by turning her chair around, engaged the next group in conversation. In this way, she was able to visit all of them as if by predilection, though her object was to show how naturally a great lady entertains. Swan's Way, the first volume of Proust's monumental novel, one of the longest ever written, was published at his own expense in 1913, for it was judged to be too discursive, too frivolous, its syntax too convoluted, besides which it had no discernible plot whatever. But intimations of approaching death spurred him on to complete his novel, and so he withdrew from society, and in his cork-lined room began a race against time and death. In 1921, he visited an exhibition of Dutch masters and was particularly moved by Vermeer's A View of Delft, which he prized above all the others. For the first time, he noticed the small blue characters in the foreground, the pink sand, and above all, a yellow patch of wall. Speaking through the voice of his character, the novelist Bergot, he wrote, Yes, that is how I should have written. I should have gone over my last works with layers of color, making each sentence a jewel in its own right. Like that bare little yellow wall. Then suddenly he grew dizzy. He felt adrift on a stormy sea, the universe tossing and pitching under him. Desperately, he tried to maintain his balance, just as in his novel, he had sought to strike a balance between life and art. But then, everyone, Proust believed, lives the novel of his own life. His was of a man attempting to recapture his past. He called his novel, A la recherche de temps perdu, in search of time lost. We know it as, Remembrance of Things Past. 